Hello, everyone, and welcome to day three of the Mid-Market IT and Security Leaders Forum. Thank you very much for sticking with us at this point. Um, day three, is, the subject matter focus is all around security. I would like to give a special thank you to our sponsors of today, HPE and Intel, for their support. We've got some amazing sessions lined up throughout the course of the day, including a presentation on securing workflows with hardware innovation. We have a roundtable discussion focusing on establishing a best of breed security strategy. We also have a, another case study on attribute based access control. And then we're going to round out the day with a fun networking session, which is an escape room experience, um, all in the theme of security. So if you've not already signed up for those sessions, please go ahead and do so if you're interested in joining, um, especially the escape room near round tables as they have limited seating. So please do that and make sure you get the most out of your experience. But before we get to all of that, we have a truly incredible Ask the Expert session for you. Our expert today is Mr. Scott E. Algenbaum. Scott is a retired FBI Cyber Division Supervisory Special Agent. That's quite a mouthful. And Scott is essentially here today to talk to you and guide you through avoiding being the next cyber victim. So the object objective of this is again to allow you the opportunity to ask Scott a number of questions. But before we do that, Scott is going to tell his story. He's going to frame this picture for you and lay down the foundations for the Q&A piece at the end. So at this point, I would love to introduce Scott to the audience. Scott, if you can show yourself. And there he is. So I'm going to uh, leave no more time, hand over to Scott and uh, you're in for a, a, a hell of a ride, folks. So enjoy. Well, great, Jason. Thank you uh, so much. I hope you can hear me right as soon as I, I hid myself, my camera, my uh, microphone fell. So, well, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everybody here can see me and hear me. If you see the big smile on my face, it is because I am retired from the FBI. And obviously, I'm not going to go into it. Great time to be retired from the FBI and retired from law enforcement. People ask me all the time, do you miss the FBI? And I go, no. Let me tell you, had a great career, 29 years. I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Uh, if I had the opportunity to do it all over again, I would do it in a heartbeat. I hope my kids would do it. So why do I not miss the FBI because today I am living what I like to call a passion project kind of life. Because I retired on my 50th birthday, January 17th, uh, 2018. Now you have my date of birth. You can social engineer me. I usually don't give that out, but I slept. I'm never always on my guard. And uh, I kind of went around the country and I've just spoke. Uh, I wrote a book called uh, The Secret to Cyber Security, uh, A Simple Plan to Protect You and Your Family. And I get to do what I love, which is sharing my experiences with individuals uh, and especially small and mid-sized companies uh, and try to teach them what I've learned. I, I, people ask me and I always say, can you define what you do in one sentence? And I can. I teach individuals and organizations how not to become the next victim of a cybercrime incident without spending money. You want to avoid all, all costs whatsoever? Just move in with the uh, Eskimos. But it, I'm going to show you what I've learned in my career. And hopefully you're going to understand what I'm talking about being passionate about your topic. And that is so absolutely important for anyone in what you do, especially in my field. Who's kidding who? Cybercrime is a huge problem. According to Cybersecurity Ventures, by in 2015, the cybercrime problem was a $3 trillion problem. $3 trillion. And by 2021, it was expected to go up to a $6 trillion problem. That's by 2021. That's in a couple of months. But all of a sudden, something happened through a monkey wrench into it. And what was that? COVID-19. COVID-19 came in and it made every organization test their disaster recovery, business continuity plans. And what did we see? 
everybody is working from home. I love to go out, you know, I'm in Nashville. I'm still talking to people all the time. I'm still talking to uh, small businesses. I'm still talking to mid-sized businesses. And I love talking to, cut to the people who are logging in. And I usually say two things. So you're logging in, you're logging in from home, right? I go, are you using VPN and are you using two-factor authentication? And that's when they go like this, what, what's that? And we're going to talk about that because cybercrime is out of control. We're dealing with the business email compromise. We're dealing with uh, account compromises, distribution of malware, and we're dealing with ransomware. I'm tired of talking about ransomware. I was talking about ransomware in 2015. Probably the number one question or the number two question, number one question I always get is, did I work on Hillary's email? No, I did not. I was in Nashville for most of my career. But the other question is ransomware. Do we pay the ransom or do we not pay the ransom? This is where I love the interactive part. So I wanna ask you guys, what do you think? Yes, no, or it depends. Bum, 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 bum. Bum, 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 bum. Results see. are coming through. Results are coming through. Oh, look through. at that. Yeah. Look at that. It depends. Come on, guys. We got 43 people out there. You're killing my time. Come on, answer the question. Let me see what we have over here. All right. I love this. This is great. And I'd like to really thank the three people who said yes. When I was with the FBI, I always told people, no, we do not pay the ransom because the rent paying the ransom, you're never going to, you don't know if you're going to get it back. It goes to support bad guys and everything like that. And, you know, there's just a ton of reasons. I even think in my book, I even believe that in my book, I said, don't pay the ransom. That's great in theory, but as the great Mike Tyson, the great philosopher Mike Tyson said, a plan is only a plan until you get punched in the mouth. What, what, what am I talking about? I am uh, talking about the fact is that today, a majority of the ransomware that we're dealing with is targeting the backups first. Think about this. So think about how long, that would have been another great poll question, Jason, but I didn't even think about it. How long can an organization survive without having access to your information? And um, I'm just trying to move the poll thing away, so I don't know why I want to look at myself. But that's the thing. And even when they steal your information, they can, it doesn't even matter. It just doesn't matter because if they, if they, if you get ransomware, they can steal it just as well. We talk about the available, we talk about when we backing up, backing up is not enough. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more and guys, I'm gonna give you information after, I'm gonna have you connect with me. I'm gonna throw a ton of information out at you. Uh, when Jason's brought me on said, can you give your best 35 minutes? I was like, I know I'm from New York and I know I talk really fast, but I got a lot of info and I put down some really good bullet points. But let's think about it. We all know the cyber crime problem has gone from a $3 trillion problem to a $6 trillion problem. But what else is going on? In 2015, according to Cybersecurity Ventures, we were spending $88 billion on keeping ourselves safe. What were we spending money on? We were spending money on hardware. We were spending money on services. We were spending money on consultants, insurance, cybersecurity awareness. You know what I joke? You know what we didn't spend enough money with? Books, right? Books would solve the problem because you see this hard-covered book? This book is great. You can take this book and you can smash your laptop or your phone and then your computer won't work. So I joke, I go, I guess I'm part of the problem. But by the same period of time, cybercrime cumulatively spending is a trillion dollars by 2021. So you know what that means if we keep spending money and the problem keeps getting worse? I'm gonna tell you what it means in my personal opinion. And this is what's great since I don't work for anyone. It means we're not doing it right. I pray all the time that someone's gonna call me out and say, Scott, we are doing it right. I was at a session one time and I was with uh, a company and they heard my presentation and they said, Scott, we don't like your presentation. 
I was like, what, was I a little too obnoxious? I'm from New York. I talk a lot with my hands. I like to move. I don't sit still. There's a lot of reasons to find fault in what I do. I love it. They said, Scott, you tend to oversimplify the problem so much that people aren't going to want to run out and spend money. And at that point, I went like this. Aha, I figured it out. I have a message that I really need to get out. And then I fired the client because I'm not here. I'm here to teach people. So, you know, one of the things I want to make sure is that you guys are in the right place. If you're looking to hear from an FBI agent who put a lot of bad guys in jail, who saved the day, or who had a lot of technical experience, who's going to show you how, what's it called, how zero trust works, or look at your outbound traffic, you're in the right, you're in the wrong place. So I want to do another poll. I want to ask, hey guys, I just want to make sure we're in the same thing. Are we in the, are you in the right place? And the reason I do these things, oh, I would love for someone to say no, because then I go, what the heck are they talking about? And I can't read it. Well, good. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I started with the FBI when I one. Oh, come on. I love those no's. That's great. Leave now. <laughs> We're all kind of friends now online. I wish I could see all of you guys and see who was, you know, had was going like that or something like that. But I started with the FBI in 1988 as a file clerk in the New York City field office, 20 years old, raised by a single mom who figured out the only great way to keep me out of jail was to embed me into a law enforcement agency where I was surrounded by positive role models. And I joke now, my mom's 85 years old and I retired when I was 50. And she says, oh, this is so good. In her best New York, she's like, oi, this was the only way I knew I could keep you out of jail by embedding you in. And what a great opportunity. Went to school at night, finished a bachelor's degree, started working on an MBA in finance and technology at Fordham University in 1992. I was an early innovator in technology because I knew how to use an AOL, use AOL by plugging it in. I became an FBI agent in 1995 and I got sent to Syracuse, New York where I was an FBI agent. Uh, and you see, now I'm making the mistake, I'm reading some of your great questions here. It's kind of like squirrels, so I'm gonna hold off. And I'm gonna show you guys how to hook up with me because I wanna take questions and answers. I got a platform that I'm using and I love to talk to people and I love to share my experiences. But so I become an FBI agent, 1995. I'm sent to Syracuse, New York. If you'd asked me to find the role of the FBI or an FBI agent in 1995, I would say it was so easy and so simple to do. There were bad people. Oh, Joe's uh, over here in Syracuse. All right. I lived over off of Meadowbrook Parkway back in the day. FBI agent in Syracuse, 95 to 2003. I figured out what Lake Effect snow is, uh, 198 inches of snow on the bad years. And if you would ask me to define the role of an FBI agent in 95, I'd say it was so easy and simple to do. Bad people were doing bad things to good people. I worked with state and local cops. I put bad guys in jail. What a fun and exciting job for a 27-year-old kid from Brooklyn, New York, a gun, a badge, a bulletproof vest. I got to play cops and robbers with my friends. How did I get involved in cyber? I didn't join the FBI to work cybercrime. That's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to play the role of hero, which is what I did. I got stuck working some cyber cases. I was the only agent in the office who had a home computer, so, and I couldn't get it off me. I was working early cyber cases in 96, chasing thrill seekers, chasing amateurs, uh, dealing with phishing cases in 2002. In 2003, I was promoted to a supervisor at FBI headquarters. I did not want to get promoted to a supervisor. I did not want to work cyber, but I married a young lady from Ahoma, Louisiana. And when you bring a Southern girl up to Syracuse, New York, the Southerners just can't handle the 192 inches of snow. So I moved to Syracuse, I moved to DC. I get involved in a newly formed FBI cyber division at FBI headquarters. And all of my friends make fun of me 
They all tell me that I'm committing career suicide because this cyber problem is going to go away by 2006. Okay, 2006, it's going to go away. So I'm in DC for three years. I go around the country, I speak, I'm helping build the FBI cyber task force programs and all of the field offices and opportunity to opens up to become the first supervisor of the FBI cyber squad in the FBI in Nashville, Tennessee. And my wife was so excited. I'm from New York, she's from New Orleans. I'm like, slow down, Sparky. I don't think we're gonna get bagel or pizza here. Pizza with two R's, as I like to joke. Moved to Syracuse and I moved to Nashville and I start the first cybercrime squad in Nashville. And here I am going, okay, this is gonna be pretty easy. You know, I played the role of hero in Syracuse with regular cases. Crime is crime. What do we do? We open cases, we get subpoenas, we work with other law enforcement agencies, we look at victims, we put bad guys in jail. That's what I spent a decade doing. And then all of a sudden, I realized I couldn't do that. I realized that I'm interviewing these victims. We we're getting subpoenas. The bad guys are located overseas. It starts to become really, really, really frustrating. So what do I do? I start building relationships with the biggest companies in Nashville. I don't know if anyone here is from Nashville, but I'm building relationships with Vanderbilt and Nissan and Bridgestone. And here I am interacting with these organizations. And it wasn't easy at first. You know, I'm like, hi, I'm Scott from the government. Does anyone want to come over? And does anyone want to uh, be with me or anything like that? No, it didn't, really, uh, it didn't really work out as well as I wanted it to. However, kept plowing along. And all of a sudden, as I said, I started getting really frustrated. I couldn't become the hero of the situation. And then all of a sudden, around 2014, cyber takes a really, really sinister, sinister turn because what do we have? We have the target breach in 2013. 2014, I'm working on the community health systems breach in Nashville, Tennessee, which is the first time we see the Chinese government actually steal healthcare records. I can go into that topic for about an hour and a half. We see Anthem. So now there's a targeted effort attacking healthcare. And now we have South Korea. And that is when it explodes. It explodes and it doesn't stop after that for the next. It hasn't stopped from that point in time. And during this period, I'm going out and now I'm no longer the supervisor. I didn't want to go back to Washington, D.C. So I am sitting here now. I'm going out. I'm interviewing all these people. And in my career, I probably interviewed a thousand victimizations. And one of the things that I kind of discovered, you know, I kind of had this aha moment. I realized that all of these individual, all of these victims all had the same elements in common, which I refer to as the four truths to cybersecurity. The first truth is, and guys, I'm going to have you connect with me. I'm going to show you how to do it. I'm going to give you the four truths. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the elements that I'm also going to share with you because I want you to implement this immediately. Uh, one of the things that I realized was that the first commonality is none of my victims ever expected to be victims, especially my small and mid-sized organizations. I had organizations that had $300 million companies considered themselves small. I dealt with small businesses, nonprofits, the organizations kind of like yourself that aren't in that enterprise level that have the ability to throw tons of cash at the problem. They did not have that kind of money to throw at it. And what did I see? So when I'd go over and sit down with these organizations, I would say, are you worried about becoming a victim? They go, no, we're a small company. I heard it all the time in healthcare. I don't know if we have any healthcare companies here, but everyone would go like this. We're a small company. Well, what does that mean? Well, we're not publicly traded. So I'd go to companies that were publicly traded and you know what they would tell me? Hey, we're on the NASDAQ. The bad guys are only targeting companies on the New York Stock Exchange. Then I would talk to companies on the New York Stock Exchange. I'd say, hey, are you concerned? And they go, no, we only have a net asset value. One company said we only have a net asset value of $5.8 billion. And they would say, hey, I just want 
what do we have to worry about? The bad guys are targeting large organizations. And I would want to say, where are you getting your information from? People Magazine. The bad guys do not care who you are. They want access to your information. They want access to your stuff. They do not care if you're in Syracuse, New York, or Nashville, Tennessee, or somewhere. They want it. And that's why the problem keeps getting worse. So I want you to think about it in your organization. What do you have that the bad guys can steal? Now, when I'm going out and I'm doing consulting, uh, not consulting, coaching for C-suites, because that's where I get brought in, because I don't do consulting, I coach. And I talk to them and I take them through a process because I'll sit down with the IT department and I'll say, hey guys, what are you responsible for securing? And they'll tell me. And then I'll start pulling out all these other platforms that I potentially see risks, such as all the different cloud platforms that the IT guys and the information security guys have no idea about. I just had another aha moment with an organization because nobody was enforcing two-factor authentication on their Salesforce account. Nobody was enforcing it on their payroll account, on their PeopleSoft, on where they're storing legal documentation. They have IoT devices and everyone's pointing fingers at everyone and guys, I got tons of key, I got tons of stories that support what I'm talking about. And think about it on the home side. What do we have? 65 million Americans victimized by identity theft. You know how many hours it takes to fix your problems? And then the next element is when the bad guys steal your stuff. Well, we talked about it. The bad guys steal your stuff. You're probably not getting it back. The business email compromise, $33 billion. I deal with this all the time. I must have touched $150 billion worth of losses in Nashville alone. And I've sat down and I'm like, okay, and we're going to get to the aha moment because I'm talking a little bit about the struggle that I had. So the bad guys steal your stuff. We're probably not, law enforcement is not getting it back. And the chances of the bad guys going to jail is really, really challenging because our bad guys are located overseas. They're not located in upstate New York. They're located in China. They're located in uh, Eastern Europe. They're located uh, in Asia. And I used to joke all the time, but due to political correctness, no, I'm not political correct. I'm gonna tell you something that probably no one's ever confirmed as an FBI agent, the Russians are hacking us. And everyone, every time I say that in front of a live audience, I love to see people's expressions. Why am I being so sarcastic? Because in 2007, Brian Krebs broke the story about the Russian business network being the number one threat to the financial services sector. And for the first time, the FBI made a coordinated effort to tell the financial services sector that Russian organized crime was the number one threat to them in 2007. And when I went out and I told that message, it gave everybody, it just kind of people said, what do we need to do that for? Okay, so all right, what have we learned so far? We've learned that the bad guys steal your stuff. You're probably not getting it back. The chances of law enforcement putting the bad guys in jail are kind of slim to none. Uh, the cyber crime's getting worse. Another great polling question would be, are you feeling depressed right now? And hopefully the answer is yes, but I'm telling you, you don't need to feel depressed because then I had that epiphany when I was out. I realized that almost 90% of what I dealt with in my career could have been prevented if the victims just had a plan, a framework to put in place. And that was it. And then I realized, oh my goodness, I have to share this. So the last four years of my career, I went out and I shared my message with over at least a thousand presentations. I did it all the time. And I gave away that information all the time. And I would put it down, I put it down, I called it the cyber tips list, which I have a copy of that, which is gonna talk about the framework, which you're gonna see is so incredibly simple. And I'm gonna talk about that for about five minutes and I'm gonna give it to you guys. But, so I make this plan, it's called the cyber tips list. And it has the 12 elements of 
the 12 elements of what I would talk about. And hey guys, this is the commonalities. This is what they had. The organizations, they didn't know what was on their network. Okay, they didn't know what their stuff was. They didn't use two-factor authentication. They weren't, a, they weren't, it's, it was so simple but 90% of the organization. So I put together this cyber tips list and I gave it away and I would talk about it. And then all of a sudden I kind of got in trouble because the FBI came back and said, hey, Scott, you can't, we as the FBI, we cannot give away a list. And I did what I did most of my career. I didn't really listen to them. And I put together a list, but I said to people, I said, if you want this list, you got to shoot me an email. And during that email, I will give you my list. It's the list of things that you can do right now to change your culture and prevent yourself from being a victim. So I want you guys go over to the chat function or the question and answer function. Anyone want to take a guess and tell me uh, what percentage of organizations took me up on my offer? to be able to do this. Okay. Uh, hey, Rick, you're kind of right. 5%. I had a situation once and it was free and it was 2%. That was probably it. I went out one day and I happened to do a presentation to 500 mortgage bankers and four people picked, took me up on my offer. And then as I'm having this epiphany and I'm about to write my book and everything like that, somebody came over to me and said, Scott, are you out of your mind? What are you writing a book for? You can't even give away your information for free. And I said, because my goal is to share my experiences with the FBI to do it. Now, if anyone here has ever written a book, it's the same thing as buying a really old house. It's almost just as expensive. So I write the book. And what do I figure out? That it cost me almost two and a half times what I said it was going to be. And here I am going, all right, I'm living my passion project life. I want to sit here and I want to help people. Until I realized I was like $50,000 in debt. And I was just like, what the heck did I just do to my life? But I plugged along. I got so many speaking gigs out of it. I got coaching clients. I ended up paying off my book. And I'm so happy that I did it. And it kind of relates to the story that I just heard the other day because it got me so frustrated before. And it was like, if you go over here and you think about a helicopter, because let's remember, I saved like three to 4% of the population. And here I am, I'm a law enforcement guy. And I am like, I'm Scott Augenbaum. I think I have the answers. 90% of it could have been prevented. Why are they not coming to me? And then somebody came over and gave me this great analogy and this great story. And they said to me, look, when a helicopter, here's another, here's another uh, poll question, not poll question, a helicopter is flying over, Coast Guard, has, uh, sees a ship sinking. The helicopter does not have enough room to save everybody that is sinking. Helicopter flies over. Anyone want to take a guess? Who does the helicopter save first? Anyone know this story? Who, who does the helicopter save first? A lot of people go like this and they say, well, the helicopter kind of saves the women and children and everything like that. I'm looking at the questions and answers. Anyone know about themselves? Dan, you got it. It's not whoever grabs the rope first, but whoever swims towards you. And during my career, who did I help? I helped those who swam towards me. It was that simple. What if I stopped and I didn't do what I, what I said I was going to do? So, not, so, oh, what did I spend it on? Dan, I don't, I'm going to take questions in two seconds. Don't get me depressed. What did I spend it on? I met with my publisher the other day. And what I want to do is I kind of, uh, wrap this up. And, and I want, really want to dive into the questions. Guys, what I want you to do, yesterday while I was sitting at the pool, I realized, you know, I wrote a book, who cares? You know, how many books did I read where said I was going to change my life 
And honestly, they're still sitting on my shelf. I have what I call my framework, the people-centric framework, which is the 13 or so points that I came up with yesterday that are so easy to follow. It's like, know what is your stuff. Realize email is the problem. And I also cut out two chapters of my book. I met with my publisher. He's like, I don't care what you do. I have the two chapters on keeping your kids safe and keeping your elderly parents safe. And also been doing some stuff on this platform called mastermind.com, which I'm playing with right now that I'm gonna start doing free masterminds just to talk and answer questions because I finally found something that uh, I love to do, talk way too much. Here's what I just need you to do. You can do two things. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Scott Augenbaum, go to scottaugenbaum.com, send me a message, and I'm going to send you access to all that stuff. And if you don't want to even do that, all I'm going to tell you to do is know what is on your network, follow the core critical security controls, realize email is the number one attack vector, don't reuse your passwords, and whatever you do, Put two-factor authentication on all your personal platforms too, and at least read the stuff. There are two quick chapters about keeping your kids and keeping your parents safe. So absolutely important. That's my passion project life. I have enough clients that keep me busy all the time. I love to share uh, my thing. Let me go back. Guys, hit me up. There's a ton of questions, and I want you to We'll do, a, we'll do another session where it could be interactive. I want to test this platform out where we can all talk to each other and I can go about that. Um, Sam asks, have I ever had my identity stolen? Sam, I've been the victim of probably 17 data breaches that I know about. And what have I done? Freeze your credit. That's another thing that's in my list of things that you need to do. What are the top three to five controls that every organization should consider implementing to protect against cybercrime? I like the core critical security controls as a technical platform, but what I'm trying to do is create this framework that I'm calling the people-centric framework that has maybe 13 points that you could do and do it uh, for free. Uh, Dan, in your experience, honor among thieves, the concept is I understand if the hacker community needs self-police to paying the ransom, otherwise business model evaporates. Yeah, they'll, they'll give you back your stuff, but I've seen situations where I've had to tell organizations that all the keys for 7,000 ransomware victims are on their server. What happens when the FBI comes to your organization and tells you that you have a problem uh, and there's a server that's over there. How do you keep up with the latest and greatest in technology and cybersecurity? How do you train and coach yourself? Vikas, uh, Vikas uh, let me tell you, I'm giving the same talk I did in 2002. I am not a technology guy. My gift that I think is, and I hate to say it, is the fact that I take complex topics and I make it really, really simple. I get hired all the time. I don't like to admit this. I get hired all the time to scare C-suite executives because how do you make the C-suite change their behavior if you teach them how to be safe at home? And that is why it is so important. Everybody has my information. Uh, I think I got a couple of more questions that I, uh, I can't seem to connect with you on LinkedIn. Hey, Michael, Scott Augenbaum, scottaugenbaum.com. If you go to my website, there's a little place over there where you can uh, enter in your contact information, uh, or you can shoot me an email at saugenbaum at gmail.com. Oh, I have time to answer Dan's question, which usually freaks me out. Uh, what did I do? I paid a publisher $25,000. He got me into Barnes and Noble and Amazon. I sold very few books there. I hired an unbelievable ghostwriter. And this was the gentleman who did the book for the Duck Dynasty guys. But I made the mistake because most people just sit with a ghostwriter and he writes the book. I wrote 70,000 words and he took it to a 50,000 word manual and everything like that. Then I had to get a website. And then I realized that 
nobody knew I had a book and then I had to pay a promotions company and then all was said and done and my publisher goes, well, how many books you want? And I go, well, what do you mean? And then I had to buy the books directly. But it was the greatest thing that I've ever done. I was able to get on CNN and Fox News to talk about this. And I'm in this very, very unique space because I'm one of the only guys who goes out and does what I do. And kind of, as I said in the beginning, it's a passion project life. You're gonna find a lot of people a lot smarter than me, but I don't think there's anyone more uh, passionate about keeping you and your family safe. And that's why I created the people-centric framework because I was able to get the website. And I really think that if you secure the people within the enterprise, then the enterprise will follow. And I look forward to connecting with everybody. If there's any other questions, please uh, take me up on my offer. I'm also gonna host another session once I figure out how to use the platform or I just shoot you an email and we all get together, read it over if there's any other questions. And Jason, as a New Yorker, I just pulled off probably three hours worth of talking in 35 minutes. <laughs> uh, I, th I think nobody in this session today can question your passion for this, uh, question your passion for this, Scott. So yes, the only uh, disservice you've received is from us not giving you a three hour time slot to go through absolutely everything. So thank I you so much. I thought this was all about me. Come on, <laughs> next time it has to be the Argenbaum session. It does indeed. Um, guys, uh, we have uh, posted, I have just posted Scott's LinkedIn profile in the chat feature there. So do uh, connect with him. He's very passionate about helping others. Um, as he said, you know, reach out to him on his website and he'll be able to share a lot of free information with you as well. Um, very, very, very lively session. Really, really enjoyed that. Absolutely fantastic. And thank you for getting so much in in the time allotted. And we do have to unfortunately cap, uh, call it there because I have to get in prep for the next session. But Thank you, Scott. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. Um, we do have another session taking place in about seven minutes' time, so feel free to regroup and grab your, your fluid of choice, coffee, water, whatever it may be, and uh, we'll see you there soon. But in the meantime, a virtual round of applause for Scott. Thank you so much, sir. And again, encourage everyone to reach out to and ask your questions, and hopefully some of that passion will rub off on you guys too. So thanks, everyone. We'll see you again soon.